All right, and we are live. Welcome back, everybody, to another author interview here on Andrew's Wizardly Reads. I am joined by Stephen Arian. Stephen, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Okay, well, hello. I am Stephen Arian. I am the author of Age of Darkness, Age of Dread uh, trilogies from Orbit, and uh, most recently I've done the Quest for Heroes duology, which is over this shoulder there. Yeah, you go. Nearly got it right, the mirror. And then yeah. my new epic fantasy, uh, historic fantasy trilogy has started with The Judas Blossom. Thank you. Modeled by Andrew there. Um, yeah, that came out in July. And here we are a month later. And now the super special edition hardbacks from The Broken Binding are coming out. Look at that. Very I got number cool. one. Mm -hmm. I'm loving that. Mm -hmm. There are some left, but there aren't many. And this is the thing. So it's like, if you want one, you better order it. As soon as possible from Brooklyn. Absolutely, Light. I've got I've yeah. got the special editions of the Coward and the Warrior, and I Excellent. absolutely love them. The Coward, absolutely so well. love them. So good. I'm so happy with them. Yeah, most people don't know this is actually our second interview uh, that we've done. Uh, the first one was done on Keymark Discord uh, back when it was the Oasis. Yes, that's right. That's yeah, right. Was, was, that was last year. <laughs> Was that last year? I don't know. Or the year before? <laughs> I don't know. Time and is an illusion. And ever since two thousand and twenty-one, time yeah. means nothing. There's before and there's after, and then there's yeah, a bit it, in between when no one remembers. It's all just run together. Before we get too much further, I have in the description box down below linked the Amazon landing page for Stephen's books, where you can get the Age of Darkness, you can get the Judas Blossom, you can get the Coward and the Warrior, that wonderful duology. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, I forget what the other trilogy is called. <laughs> but there's but nine books yeah. that you can check out. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> You're fine. There's, pl there's plenty to read. Like, yeah, so there's plenty I to read. <laughs> so far, I am, I'm still in the middle of Blood Mage. Uh, okay. So uh, I'm, I'm enjoying Blood Mage. That's my current read. Um, I'm about 40% into that one. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. But it's uh, very different, You'll, I think, it, you'll find to Battle Mage. It's very, very different. Um, it, mm -hmm. it becomes more of a detective um style of thing which i thought was very very interesting mm -hmm. um but we're here to talk about judas blossom sure specifically this one which is based off of genghis khan and the khanates yes how did you it. land on that time period for uh your historical fantasy that is a very good question um mm. I had an interest in mongols and mongolia and, and empires and I started digging around and doing some research. I'd watched some stuff on TV as well, like the Marco Polo TV series, which was on Netflix for two seasons and a, a sort of movie as well. It was great. Um, really enjoyed it. But all of these stories, hi everyone, all these stories focus on the Mongols who are the conquerors and who won and it's their story. And given that I have, you know, Persian heritage, I wanted to do a story set in that part of the world. And there isn't any in terms of fantasy. So the two kind of ideas marry together and I start investigating periods of history. And this one, tying it into the Mongols, probably seemed to work the best. Um, I think because it's, well, it's a very complicated part of history, but then again, a lot of it really is. And I've had to pare it down and change things and move things around. And everyone knows about Kublai Khan and Genghis Khan, and, but nobody really knows much about this period or this particular part of the world in this time. And so yeah. I thought that would be quite interesting. It will feel like pure fantasy to some people, except for historians, who will get annoyed because I've changed things. Well, I mean, you kind of have to change <laughs> some things, though. Because So I, I read Judas Blossom first, and then I went and read Wolves of the Plain by Con Engledon, mm. um, because that follows you know, the, the whole breadth of that kind of reign. Yeah. And uh, it, it's some of, a lot of it is very piecemeal, because I started researching the, the Conates because I was reading these books and realized most of the history has been destroyed anyway. Most of it's just art that's left. Yeah. Um, which we'll talk about a funny story about when I pinged you on that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so I think this, this kind of era lent itself really well to a fantasy adaption because you can take the history and you can kind of play with it a little bit more and yeah. make it a more cohesive story. Yeah, I had to ignore certain things. There's gaps where I've been able to exploit, like Princess Kokochin. We don't know much about her. According to history, she was dead within kind of three years of when she arrived in Persia. And that's kind of it. And I'm like, well, that sounds like a bit of a, you know, 
a bad end to her story. There's not much there to tell. The fact that she traveled for two years with Marco Polo, because it's in his books, mm -hmm. to get to Persia. And then when she gets there, the person she's going to marry is dead. So she marries his son, as you do, you know. Why, yeah, why sure. not? Why not? Why not? Sure, why not? Yeah, yeah, one guy's much similar. History is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, yeah, I could start introducing things. I can start um, adding new fantastical things. And the, all of the main tentpole events in Zeus Blossom are true in terms of history. But who was there and exactly when it happened and what happened, I've changed a bit. By the time you get to book two, we're kind of steering off the road a bit more. And when you get to book three, we're way off in the distance. Historians will have a proper hissy fit because it's going to be radically... If you've read the end of book one, you're like, wait, what? And then there's a lot more of that in two and three. And that's just, that's not history. That's, that's pure fiction. That's pure fantasy. So yeah, two and three are just going to be quite, quite a lot more of my own stuff. Yeah. So do, do you enjoy kind of keep just kind of running off and doing your own thing with it? <laughs> I did quite enjoy that. Yes. Just a snatch and grab. This is mine now. Ah, I can do what I want now. You can't stop. It's fiction. It's fiction. If something goes wrong, wizard did it. There are no wizards. Meh, let's say there was. <laughs> or if, I get, if I get a detail wrong, it was a wizard. But at the end of the day, I'm, I'm telling a good story. I'm not doing pure historical fiction. I'm, I wanted to bring some fantasy in. I wanted to be able to play with things. Um, you know, people like Conan Golden, who you meant, who you mentioned, he's done really good retellings as best as he can up to a point and then he's made stuff up but there's yeah. no you know fantasy in his so or less less fantasy you know yeah well, yeah that, that that's fair um yeah i mean i gotta i gotta tell you like it was funny because i read this oh let's see i got my arc i think in like january like it was i got my arc yeah. early um and I read it and I, I fell in love with it. And I was just like, oh, God, am I going to have to do a reread for this interview? And I literally <laughs> just picked up the back of the book. I read three names and all of it snapped right back. So your That's story good. has staying power. I really oh, think good. Good. I think this is your best one yet. And I love oh, wow. I remember raving about the coward. Um, this one knocked my socks off. I Thank had you. Thank you. such an enjoyable time because you do some kind of interesting stuff with the character arcs, you know, Temujin, which mm -hmm. I didn't catch that until I read Khan Engelden's books because I, I just like, oh, Genghis Khan is Genghis Khan. Okay, nope. no. <laughs> no. That's not his real name. No. That's not his real name. No. I didn't know that. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But his his character arc and the way that his story goes, I didn't see it coming from the very beginning. Mm. Uh, and how that trajectory is fascinating. And then Hooglu and Kikuchin mm -hmm. and uh, Kaivon is, mm -hmm. is, did I say that right? Kaivon? Yeah, Kaivon, yeah. Kaivon. But yeah. the way that they all weave together, it kind of weaves seamlessly. And uh, I, I figure in a fantasy book, it's a lot easier to make those storylines work for you because it's all on mostly your time schedule but mm -hmm. do you have any difficulty making them all engaging and intriguing and interesting endlessly difficult yeah um because even though i'm not doing a historical retelling there are certain events that i still have to touch mm -hmm. so it's almost like those those slalom skiers that are going downhill between the flags I'm I'm kind of doing that with the story and every now and then I've veered too far off course and I'm like oh god I've really got some angle it right back so I can hit that big event and then yeah, back to that uh, but getting them all to tie together at the same time was it's the most challenging book I've ever written it's the most difficult one the most complicated two and three were not they were a little bit easier because I wasn't as tied into history as with the Judas Blossom but it was just such an effort to kind of get it all to work and to balance out as well um, and I think in the, in the first after the first couple of drafts, I gave it to my agent and my editor, and they said, "This bit, there's too much of this, or this bit slow down." So we had to work on pacing, and you know, oh, he said, "You haven't come back to these other characters, the twelve. We need to know what's going on with them in this bit." And I'm like, "Oh yeah, you're right." So I had to kind of, so it, it was a lot of back and forth. Um, but once I'd got that balance right, I think the rest of the story sort of works quite well with the character, the arcs sort of naturally progress at a certain pace after that. So would you say that this one was probably the most work for you to write? Yeah, because <laughs> so <laughs> a couple of months ago, I was trying to get a character from point A to point B. I'm 80% of the way through writing book three at the moment. Okay. So I, my, my deadline's Christmas. I'll be finished before then. 
Um, but I needed to get a character from point A to point B. And I'm like, right, they can just, I don't know. If it was a fantasy book, I'd be like, to get on a horse, how long does it take? Um, let's say it's four days. That's fine. No one's going to know. There isn't a map where there is. No one cares. Or dragon. Yeah, two hours. Or teleport on a wizard. Five seconds. It's day sex machina. <laughs> yeah, whereas this is like, how did they get there from there to there? Um, I don't know. Could they get a ship? Maybe. Where would they sail from? I don't know. So it took me <laughs> two hours to get the answer for like a tiny paragraph. And when you're reading it, you'll be like, yep, fine, carry on and move it. Probably just skip past that detail. That took me two hours to go back and read that again and then again and then again. <laughs> I need you to spend at least an hour reading one at paragraph. Least an hour minimum for what took me an hour and a half to two hours. So yeah, just things like that. Or I go, oh no, they descend into the valley and it looks like. I don't know what it looks like. I've never been to this part of the world. Right, what kind of plants would there be? What kind of trees? I don't know. <laughs> so I just had to go and find that. So I'm constantly writing a bit and I stop, go and do some research, do the next bit, stop, do the next bit. So it's, yeah, that has slowed me down. That has made it the most challenging as well. Well, I mean, it, it's worked out well for you. At least at least in the Judas Blossom, <laughs> I will give it a, I mean, I did give it a glowing review. Um, I, I'm I'm right up in. You're here. in the book. You're in. The yeah, book I'm well. in the book. I'm right there. There you go. You see, which incredibly honored. Thank you so much, my pleasure. Um, Thank you for the good review. Oh, I love this book. Um, I gave it was probably one of the the best books I to I could ever start out the year with mm. because like and you know you never want to start out the year with like a bad book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I just think like, of like three bad books. I'm like oh oh yeah no I can't no can't thanks hope. no. So you kind of wanted to tell this story because you have Persian heritage and mm -hmm. you kind of wanted to highlight the struggles of Persia and mm -hmm. their struggles with the Khanates. Um, what, what, what made you decide to not only that this is the story you wanted to tell, but that you kind of wanted to bring bigger attention to it, I think is the question I'm trying to ask. Um, probably because people don't know much about it, I think. They don't really know about the like, thousands of years of history in this part of the world that goes back, you know. Yeah, usually when people talk about ancient Persia, I'm immediately thinking of Xerxes mm. and 300. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, but, that's where my mind immediately jumps, and then it skips everything else. Mm -hmm. it, there's, there's, there's loads that I don't know. I know I've researched this little bit from doing this, but there's you know thousands of years of history that I just don't know anything about, and it's just so much culture and art and poetry and, and history and, and the, the amount of architecture things that they built and temples that go back, you know, centuries and things that some of them have been destroyed over the years. It's like so many, so many countries, you know, when you go to a museum, they're like, Oh, this was one from 300 BC. And you go, yeah, that's, that's nice. And then you think about it. That's been around for over 2000 years. And now we get to see it in a glass case in a museum. Things like that that in the country it doesn't originate from. Uh huh. And he's kind of like that's it's it's boggling. It's mind boggling. Like oh here's a sphinx. Oh yeah, fine. And the kids run past it and you're like, this has come from Egypt. There's a man in there who's bound in. in he said his organs taken out. He's been there for thousands of years. See him on TV. Uh, I mean, back in the oh, 1900s, they used them as like kindling and torches. They just they, <laughs> they take a mummy arm and light it on fire. <laughs> <laughs> I tried it in Zelda. It doesn't work very well. Um, then, oh, okay. <laughs> it's just there's so much there there's so much to discover and if anything people reading this book go if someone says i'd like to find out a bit more about this part of the world then that would be great for me and also the food oh god the food is so good <laughs> have, you been, have you been indulging in some culinary all um... my life all my life oh, okay. I, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story um about 2002 i went to america with a friend we were city hopping across the world and we got to san diego and we're walking through the gas lamp district, looking for somewhere to, to eat for dinner. And I started smelling something. I said, my friend, there's a Persian restaurant around here. And he goes, no, there isn't. And he goes, I said, there is. I can smell it. It's like bull. I'm like, no, no, no. Went around the corner. And there it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'd been away from home for weeks traveling. But the familiar smells drew me there. And I knew it. We went in and had the best meal. So good. Well, now I kind of want to go and do some Persian food. Oh, you'll find them. The, the, I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to look it up here in in Indiana and see if, if we've got a good Persian restaurant. That's oh, they they will be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There'll be some good ones. Um, but yes, and, you find pockets of them all over. All right, all right. <laughs> it's like a secret network. 
<laughs> so I know from you know various conversations with you that you take a lot of inspiration from Gemmel and mm. a lot of you know the heroic fantasy authors. Um, how much of that ended up in the Judas Blossom? Um, some stuff's definitely to do with the the battles. Um, I always take quite a lot of time with my battles and stuff, and and the warriors and the fighting, and it's that idea of um, whenever there's a big army and there's lots of fighting it can be great to stand back and see at a distance but i like that thing where you're there in the front lines like you've read battle mage one of the characters literally a grunt on the front line it's like you see the stuff of the generals and you see the majors and it's like yeah okay but what's it like day to day for the bloke who's just fighting every day and i wanted him to have that and so there's some of that with cave on too that even though he's a general at some point in the book it's not a spoiler um, Halagu says, right, go, you're going to go and fight now with the men. You're going to go and do that. And he's like, really? I'm going to go out and run up the wall and try and kill all these people. And he's like, yep. So I wanted it to be in your face and right there and put the reader on the front line. Um, and that's what Gemmel did. That's very much what his kind of characters were. They oh, were yeah. Like, Drots would always be in the thick of it. Mm -hmm. um, Waylander is always just, you know, he's not sending people to do his dirty work for him. He's oh. the one doing the dirty work. Yeah, he's the assassin. He's the kind of killer. Um, but I, all of so long before anyone coined the phrase grim dark, characters were essentially grey morals and grey questionable duties. David Gamble was doing it in the nineties. I know that this is the thing. Other people did it before him, decades before, and it was called something else. It just wasn't called grim dark until probably Lord Grim Dark himself, Job Job Crombie. Um, uh, the, the, the coin came from Warhammer Forty K. All right, there you go. See, yeah. They just start calling Joe, you know, Lord, Lord Grimdark. Grim <laughs> but yeah, Gemmel was doing it, and I, I brought that some of that to these characters too, because some people said none of them are really kind of white hats or, or black hats. They're all fairly quite grey, and they all do questionable things in the pursuit of their goals, which I think is true, whether it's but, it's Halagu or, or Kavon. And I, I think that is necessary and needed in this book, though, because there is so much. I mean, the atrocities that Hugalu is performing. Mm -hmm. And like, I mean, quite literally, he'll walk up to a city and say, surrender. If you say no, you had your chance. Yep. And it's just, you're gone. That, um, that was what he was like. Yeah. He was a yeah, maniac. And, I've toned it down, remember? This is the thing. Everything in the book has been toned down. My editor was like, oh, man, that's terrible. I'm like, yeah, but I've still toned it down from what they actually did. <laughs> well, yeah, a, a lot of people, uh, it, it's hard to imagine, but at that time period, the Mongols reduced the world's population. I think by what was it, thirty percent? It was something ridiculous. Like it was, it was enough to affect greenhouse gases. Yeah, it changed <laughs> the atmosphere of the Earth. That that many people died. The amount of people breathing oxygen was so much different that the atmosphere was better. Um, I, I I was doing research because your book made me want to know more about this time period. Excellent. And they were saying that like areas, and I think it's Persia. Mm -hmm. um, but areas hadn't recovered the population until the mid 2000s from what the from what um, the Khanates did in those areas. Mm -hmm. Like it was such a decimation of population that mm -hmm. it literally took hundreds of years to recover the population just yeah. to match the population numbers from that time period. Yeah. And the thing is now the capital city of, of, of Persia, now Iran, is Tehran. It didn't used to be the capital. Genghis Khan destroyed the capital city. It was called, I think it's called Ray. It's gone. It's a ruin. And there's nothing left in it now. There might be some small ruins here and there, but they just, he completely decimated it. So my story is in 1260, and Genghis Khan was running around essentially 80 years before that, or thereabouts, destroying all parts of the world all over. Because we start the story where a large portion of the world has been conquered. It's because of his efforts and then his son's efforts. And now we're here with the grandsons of Genghis Khan trying to hold on to his legacy and grow it. But he'd killed so many people and done so much damage. It's it's ridiculous. It's wild. Mm. I mean, it, and just the stuff, like the, the history I learned by wanting to know more from reading Judas Blossom is mm. it's fascinating stuff to learn. <laughs> And I've always, like, I still, now I want to go and research more. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was watching a video of yours lately, though. Mm -hmm. And we'll come back to the Judas Blossom. But yeah. you, the traditionally published author, are going to be dipping your toe into self-pub. Yes, this is true. And me being the self-pub proponent wants to know more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, 
you're, you're halfway through reading um, Blood Mage, and the best way to describe that book is fantasy with some crime, I would say. There's crime families, there's a, a, essentially like a police detective investigating things, and there's magic and other things. And the book scratched the itch for a while, but not completely. So this new thing that I've written, it's done. It's it's quite short. It's 42,000 words. Now, according to the rules of the Hugos, a novel is anything above 40,000 mm -hmm. words. And I'm I'm probably just, I'm still calling it a novella because it's a very short, you know, book if it was. And I wanted to do something similar again to Blood Mage in a certain way. Um so we're I'm, it's being described as fantasy noir, I would say. Okay. It's first person as well, which I haven't done before. Now I've written it before and, and I've got trunk novels that are in the first person, but I've never released anything as first person. So that's new for me. Um and it's about a guy who's a private investigator involving uh, him and his old friend get together and they're investigating a missing person. And it's in a fantasy-like setting, I'll say. <laughs> fantasy-like. Uh, so like fantasy adjacent? Yeah, let's say that. Yeah. Um, and... I consider like GM, GM White's um, The Swordsman's Lament and Descent. That's basically fantasy adjacent. Because mm -hmm. there's like magic in there, but it's just like a quick tip of the hat and then it's all about fencing mm -hmm. so is it something kind of like that this is so if you, if you read any of like low fantasy books where you know it's kind of gritty and grim and it's not quite grim dark but like daniel polanski's done some low fantasy okay. books where magic is a part of the world but it's not the main thing and it's very street level this is kind of like that there isn't any magic but there's something else there but it's set in a city and it's about this guy looking for a missing person's case with his friend um, it's inspired by lots of different things. It's inspired by my love of PI stories and, you know, Dresden Files and um, what else? I'm trying to think. What, um, Happen Leonard novels by Joe Lansdale. They, they're they incredible as well and amazing and really short and tight and the, the prose is so punchy. Um, so it's, yeah, I wanted to try something. I've got another one in mind and i think i want to kind of do three of these with these three characters these two characters um okay. and the second one is going to be a bit it's going to be different again it's going to be more like do you ever see true detective season one i uh, i remember catching bits of it second one's going to be more like that like really okay. creepy disturbing there again these two investigating a crime but possibly a cult possibly weird possibly disturbing and is it real is it magic who knows but yeah the first one is street level in a city in well a if you floor. ever need your protagonist to knock somebody out feel free to use the name andrew and I'll know <laughs> okay sure, I'll be sure. incredibly honored uh, <laughs> to just get knocked out by one of your protagonists all right, all right. i mean patrick leo always gets murdered i don't really <laughs> want to get murdered i would just like to get knocked out a time or two all right okay 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 yeah, yeah. I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna do with that what you will. <laughs> sure, sure. I, I, can, I can swap out a name for someone getting knocked out if you want. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, okay, so it's 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 different. So at the, at the moment, uh, people are beta reading it. Um, I'm going to be chronicling my journey on my YouTube channel, talking to uh, experts. I've got a number of friends lined up who are self-published authors and indie authors and say, I know the basics, the editing stages and all the rest of it, but then what? How does it work? What do you do? How do you promote the book? Where do you go? You know, how much do you spend on advertising? What's a good rate for a cover? What's a bad rate? All these kind of things I don't know because I've never done it. So it's going to be an adventure for me to find out. And hopefully other people will learn from any mistakes that I make along the way. So awesome. So as part of the reason you're wanting to self-pub this is to just experience self-pub versus yeah. grad pub. Yeah, I mean, I'm still under contract for, for you know Judas Books 2 and 3. And I've got things lined up to pitch to my publisher after that. But I'm going to try and do this alongside um, because, you know, I still have a day job and I and I do the writing as well. So doing a novel, a full novel in along with everything else is a bit a bit tricky. But a novella or 45, 50 K short novel novella, that's possible, I think. Um, so, yeah, if this one if this one does well. I definitely want to do the second one. But I've got ideas for other things, too. So I'm going to see how it goes with this one. I'm going to chronicle everything. Um, and then, fingers crossed, see what people think of it. Well, luckily, there's a good indie publisher that you're very very good friends with, 
Uh, they started putting out their own books. They're called The Broken Binding. Uh, I have heard of them before yeah. somewhere. You've heard of them. In fact, you might have held up a book earlier. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, so yeah, yeah. That, that, yeah. yeah maybe. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, ebook, sure. Audiobook, I don't know because then I don't really know, like, how does that work? How much does it cost? Where do you go? What's it's ungodly it? expensive, from what I understand. See, so like ebook and paperback is probably going to be a thing for. for um, I. I've known self-pub authors who got covers for $500 mm. and I've known self-pub authors who got covers for $3,500. Wow. Um, which I, I don't know, 3,500 is probably around 3,200 pounds. Mm. Cause the pounds a little bit stronger than the dollar from what I understand. Mm -hmm. um, I well, at least I always pay more dollars for, you know, anyway, whenever I'm shipping overseas yeah, all, yeah, yeah. all the time, but um, yeah. And uh, audio, I know some people like uh, will do Kickstarters for audio mm -hmm. and they'll set the Kickstarting goal at like, you know, Hey, we need $5,000 in order to hire this narrator. So it's, it's expensive. Yeah. It's in, like, I don't know how, like I've got two shelves of self pub and I'm just like, you guys are rock stars because <laughs> my wife would kill me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. We're going to come back to the Judas Blossom and I cool. want to talk about Hugalu mm -hmm. because when I was I was reading the whole book, I'm like, this guy is awesome. This guy is so cool. He's angry. He's big. He's <laughs> monstrous. He's buff. And so then I go to do the research and I pull up a picture of Hugalu mm -hmm. and I send it to you and going, is this the right guy? <laughs> <laughs> and you were like, I might have taken a couple liberties. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So According to history, um, there's a bit, I think it's in the Juice Blossom actually, where Temujin's talking about his grandfather, his, uh, uh, yeah, his great grandfather, uh, or no, Halagu's talk talking about his grandfather. So everyone remembers him as a great man, a conqueror, changed the world, but physically, quite a small guy, wasn't really massive, you know. And I thought it'd be quite an interesting contrast to the fact that all four of the brothers are really big men in my story. So whether it's Kublai, Arik, uh, Monke, who died, and Halagu. I made them all quite four really large men because it goes with their egos and it goes with their attitude mm -hmm. and the fact that they're li the leaders, where in reality, they weren't enormous men at all. They just, you know, they weren't really that tall. They were just kind of average. But what they did, you know, is is what made them perhaps bigger than people remember. It's like when, they, when everyone does a painting with someone, they're like, can you make me just a little bit, you know, a little bit taller? And can you straighten my nose just a bit? And can you, you know, give me better eyebrow? And it's just like that. So I've kind of, I've tweaked some of the things in history. I, I think what yeah. got me the most was his feet. Um, they were they're just these tiny little triangles. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just, I was like, oh, Galu, oh no, <laughs> great character read, fantastic. Mm -hmm. I love, the, I prefer the way you portrayed him versus uh, the historical painting did. Because I've been laughing about it for months. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's it's, <laughs> it, it's fantastic. So, when did you start writing the Judas Blossom? Oh, quite a while ago now. Because I am always planning the next thing before I finished. So, at the moment, I'm you know I'm planning the next thing already, and book two's not out, and book three's not out. So, I start. Gathering, gathering some books, doing some research. Um, I've got a bunch on my shelf. I started just going through. Um, I started writing the first draft. Let's see, it's 2023 now, 20, so sometime in 2021, probably. Okay, so about yeah. two years. Yeah, yeah. So I started writing it then and I handed in the first draft. Um, Chris, it would have been, would have been Christmas or mid, mid 2022 to come out in 2023. Yeah, normally it's about a year before it comes out. From what I handed in, so yeah, it's been about two years writing, uh, but uh, uh, probably a year before that of research, I'd say. Okay, mm. so you ju you're just constantly coming up with new ideas to kind of explore new things. The the one thing I will notice about the way you write is you're always doing something new. You don't mm. just find the formula and stick with it. Um, like when I read Battle Mage, that was big and bombastic and battlefields. 
And so I figured, I figured. <laughs> How'd you go well, bigger than a world war, Andrew? <laughs> well, Intergalactic <quite>, war. <laughs> yeah. Well, quite wrongly, that blood mage would continue that theme. And I was like, oh, it's going to be another big blow up. And it, it actually shrinks in scope. Mm -hmm. And you've got these desiccated bodies showing up around this town and they're trying to find out who this killer is. There might be some history where like some similar stuff happened in the past, but nobody like, you know, it can't possibly be that. And so it, it's it's interesting. And then like you do The Coward, where that one was like probably your most Gemmel-esque book, I think. Mm, yeah. And uh, you've kind of got like heroic fantasy and then you kind of go different in the warrior and then you go historical fantasy so you're very broad in your writing and i really like that because it means you're never going to get stale <laughs> i don't want to ever, ever repeat myself like so wait till you get to chaos mage so the yeah the first trilogy battle mage is a war book blood mage is a crime and police book chaos mage is a post-apocalyptic horror novel really set on a city on the edge of the world and it ties things together from one and two characters and ripples and threads I pull through into Chaos Mage. So that's that, you know, that's different again. So when you get to Chaos Mage, you'll be like, okay, what the? There's there's lots of nods to little films and things in there. I'll tell you once you're done. Um, so I I never want to repeat myself. On my second trilogy, it's one huge story cut into three. Okay, and it's set ten years after the event of of Chaos Mage. And I've so I've done the Wizards. I've done six books about Mage. It's in the title, kind of a giveaway. Uh, done the wizard thing, done big magic, done small magic in that book, in those books as well in some places. And I thought, right, I want to do something different. So with the coward and the warrior, the coward is very much about what it means to be a hero, the nature of heroism, how we put our heroes up on a pedestal, how we treat them in the real world. There's a nod in there to like things like reality TV and X Factor shows where you, you vote for people. There's stuff like that in there in the books. There's all uh, also about people who come back from war, what happens to them, the effects of war and PTSD on people. Um, and then with the warrior, I'll give you the pitch I gave to my, my e editor for the warrior. Okay. It's the wizard of Oz in the upside down. Okay. If you've, if you've seen stranger things, all right, that's the pitch for the warrior. And they went, Oh, uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> and there's an even bigger, if you've read the Warrior, there's an even bigger twist, but, uh, pitch but once i say it it spoils things i can't say it to people who haven't read it and then they go oh of course oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> when i point things out afterwards it's like oh this oh right and it's all that i've done that now so i want to do something different again so yeah historical fantasy trilogy i'm nearly done now and then i'm gonna do something different again and i've got three standalone ideas i want to pitch to my my agent and editor and then we'll see what they think of them. So, but different again. I'm not, I can't, I'll get bored. It'll be boring to write. It'll be boring to read. Ah, and I want to explore. Fantasy is an enormous umbrella and you can tell any kind of story really. And so now I'm just having fun and trying different things. Have you considered trying to retell Robocop and actually <laughs> make a good movie? Well, given that the remake that they did was so appalling, you could defeat him by shooting his non-metallic hand and therefore <laughs> the film ends. Or... How about the remake of, uh, what was it, Total Recall, where the lift that goes through the center of the earth. <laughs> For all the flaws of the original Total Recall, the remake was appallingly bad. I'm, so... I was, I'm just calling back to a conversation you did with Crystal Matar, where yeah. I was in the... Was so in... bad. Oh, well. <laughs> but yes, I don't know. She hadn't seen Robocop, I think, had she? Oh, I, don't, I can't remember, but... Um, I don't think she had. Yeah. So something different again. It stops me getting bored. It keeps me stretched. You know, you know, writing's like a muscle. You got to do something different and some interesting and something new. And there's so many corners to explore in fantasy. So, I mean, you could do gas lamp. You could do flintlock. Mm -hmm. You can do. I mean, ugh, there's so much steampunk. Well, yeah, you can move Those technology right forward. Off the top of my head. Yeah, you can go forward to things like. You know, Joe Abercrombie's just done with the Age of Madness, where technologies move forward. There's cannons and there's black powder and, you know, mechanization and printing presses and sort of industrializations coming in. And that's kind of moving things forward again. So there's lots of places to, to play, you know. I haven't done any dragons yet. Maybe I'll do dragons one day. You could always do, uh, oh, that's true, you haven't done dragons. Mm -mm. You could always do um, kind of alternate history fantasy, which is kind of what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking more like the rights of magicians and like colonial America or yep. 
Or you could do, you know what, you know what you don't see a lot of is you always hear about the colonial America, at least living in America. Sure. Uh, I hear about that, but you never hear about it from the Brit side. (laughs) (laughs) So you can do a fantasy about that. That'd be cool. Really popular in America. I think they'd love that. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, listen, in the publishing game, it's all about making money, okay? I'm thinking, like, wasn't there a war to do with that? I'm sure there's some kind of war of independence. (laughs) Uh, I may have read about it. I heard about it somewhere. Yeah. You know, we don't study it, but you do, so. (laughs) Which is weird. You think we'd both study it at school, but we don't. We're so proud of it. That's probably why. That's why we don't talk about it. <laughs> We're so proud. Over this side of the pond, nah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Fair. Um, yeah. So one of the things that I've always been kind of interested about, because this is kind of a traditional publishing question, mm. is as an author, you went from Orbit to Angry Robot. Mm-hmm. Um, like, how does a transition like that happen? So I did my first trilogy with Orbit. It did really, really well. Mm-hmm. And you know, did they, they loved it? And they said, "Do us another one." Did really, really well. Started working on the um, the second trilogy, and it's it was doing okay. And by the time I got to the end of it, um, they did make me an offer on the Coward and the Warrior, you know, for the new series. But it wasn't as good as the offer I got from Angry Robot. And okay. from talking to my uh, editor there, who's my editor now, and the ideas that they had and the way she wanted to things that she wanted to do. It was a more comfortable fit, and I got a better deal. So I went to their Angry Robot, and I win. Uh, oh, thanks, thanks, PL. Yeah, PL <laughs> coming in clutch, coming in all the way from Canada. Um, so yeah, I, I've been with Angry Robot since the Coward, and uh, by the end, the time this trilogy wraps up, it'll be five books with Angry Robot. I mean, they're a smaller team, but they're fantastic people. I love working, you know, with my. Uh, editors and uh, Caroline who does the PR and Caroline's amazing. She's she's brilliant. She's just so good. And Amy who does events and uh, you know, just, lots of other people. I just got this book from Angry Robot Lessons in Bird Watching and it came with this like little bronze feather. Ooh, nice, nice bookmark. Right? Beautiful. Yeah. Um, I gotta get to it. But Angry Robot, mm-hmm. I, I like Angry Robot. It, probably of the of the traditional publishers, Angry Robot's one of my favorites. Just mm. because I, I find Angry Robot is doing a lot of big ideas. Yes. So, like, normally the ideas that I'm noticing coming out of Angry Robot are they're traditionally publishing what is initially or what would usually be a self-pub book. So, like, those kind of big ideas that most of traditional publishing isn't willing to take the chance on. Yeah. yeah. I'm seeing that come out of Angry Robot. A little yeah. bit out of orbit, but not as much. Um, yeah. Angry, Angry Robot's got a catalog. And when you read that catalog, you're like, how did... Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> it's it's There's a lot. Of, but some people had started there and then have gone back and forth. So like N.K. Jemison did a trilogy back there in the day. And other people have. And then they come back and do other books. And they have really amazing ideas. And some people will pitch something. And you think... That's insane. That's ridiculous. Oh, that sounds that sounds like an anti robot book. And you're like, you're probably right. It probably is. You know, like Chris Panettiere has some fantastic ideas. I mean, he's I'm looking forward to his new like Cam Johnston's got a great book coming next year. Um, I've you know, I've he told me a little bit about it. I'm like, that sounds so cool. Just you know, great ideas. And next this year one we'll sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah. Blade I can't, Priest, yeah. Leslie, Leslie, the the nerdy narrative. Um yeah. she uh she read that one and got me to got me to put it put it in my shopping cart. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think they have fantastic authors with some brilliant ideas that they come in with, and people will, will will try, you know, and see what happens with some great stuff. Fair enough. Let's bring this back to Judas Boston before we mm. go off on a tangent, uh-huh. um, because I know it's it's getting later where you are, and I don't want to keep you up all night when you got probably work in the morning. <laughs> Um, it's, go- it's going on 10 o'clock where you're at. Or getting, close. getting there. It's getting there, yeah. Yeah, it's getting there. So what was kind of... Who was your favorite character to research and write in Judas Blossom? Hmm, that's a good one. Well, well, Kayvon is obviously completely made up. Halagu is the one that I probably did a fair bit of research on. Um with Coca Chin, because it stops, I could make a lot more stuff up with her, and we don't know much about her. 
So I think where I had more creativity, that was more fun to write for me. It was slightly less restrictive because if you do like work for hire, like if you go and work for Marvel and you say, right, go and write Captain America book or, or comic, and you're like, these are the kind of guidelines you have to work within. It felt a bit like that at times with Halagu and some of the other things, especially the events. So when I got to do Temujin, who's completely made up, you know, Halagu had lots and lots of sons and daughters, but he didn't have one called Temujin. Um, well, so I mean, that's there. Genghis Khan's name, so... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um... <laughs> You would think uh, maybe he named him this when high hopes that he would live up to the name, but like mm -hmm. Timujin's like his least favorite son. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really just doesn't doesn't do much at all. And like you know, Jumger is completely insane. He's like a version of Jane Cobb from Firefly with a really bad temper and a massive axe. He likes chopping up people. Um, you know, so <laughs> so I think I had more fun writing the characters that I got to play around with more because I didn't, I wasn't as worried about history as much and thinking I can't, I can't, you know, do too much with this one or change it too much because they have to hit certain things in history points that I need for this story. So every time I moved something, it created a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. So in the editing process in the first one, it was like, can you change this? I'm like, yes, but it'll change this, 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 and this knock on of it. I mean, it happens with every book. But it was tighter with this one because of all the history involved. So difficult. Well, I kind of, I kind of like because you've got a magic system in here that it needs to be rediscovered. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a hidden magical society that has kind of removed all references of to itself, except for like a little tidbit here, a little bit tidbit here, and then you got to put the puzzle together, mm -hmm. uh, and then you're gonna kind of wish that you hadn't solved the puzzle. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh yeah, uh, and I kind of yeah. like that. I, a, I didn't know that Timujin uh, was made up mm. because for some reason I just immediately associated it with Genghis Khan. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, "Oh, cool!" Like I, there was a there was cool, <laughs> cool. Like I didn't even question it. No, so. <laughs> see, good, good, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was just like, "Oh yeah, cool." There's two of them. I didn't know that, yeah. but I kind of liked Kavon because he's you know he's from a conquered nation. He's mm. been you know his. He's tried. He's tried the resistance route. It didn't work well well for him. So he's like, "Well, if I can't beat him, maybe I'll join him. And if I join him, maybe I can beat him." Mm -hmm. And that's like his whole shtick. And I love. I, I just I loved it because you've got this. A you've got this secret council of Persians, mm -hmm. and they're trying to like push back as any way they possibly can. And then you've kind of got Kavon doing his thing without telling them about it. Yep. And it's just, it's great <laughs> watching all of that happen and the way the web kind of connects. Mm. That I'm so excited to see where the rest of the trilogy goes. Mm. Yes, there's there's more overlaps. There's more things that are connected. By the end of the first book, if, if there's lots of things that are kind of falling into place. Characters have changed quite a lot. All of them, I think, by the end of that first book. Um, oh yeah, Temujin's completely different. He went from fat, out of shape, to like warrior monk. Mm -hmm. And you know, cave on from a guy with no hope, uh, ready to kind of basically kill himself or just give it give up his life in a suicide attack, even though he knows it's pointless. To well, maybe I can do something. Maybe there is hope in a different way. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and then there's the secret societies. There's there's lots of different things creeping around the edges, and there's. There's more to come because there's a bit at the end of the, of the first book, which you've read, where something happens and you're like, oh no, that's that's that can't be good. That can't be good. And there's more of that to come in the second and third book. So as you say, you keep you go searching for an answer, and when the answer finds you, it's not always a good thing, is it? No, it's not always a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> now, before we went live, you mentioned that there's an audiobook coming out. Or it is, is it already out? out? It's out, yeah. It's, it's, it's out now. Mm -hmm. Now, who is, who is the narrator, and why is it cool? Because so, you were telling I, me about this, and I, I started geeking out, and I don't even know who it is. <laughs> so the uh, I wanted to have um, a Persian narrator, if possible, for the audiobook, and a Persian artist for the cover. We couldn't get one for the cover, but there what there is some artwork in the book, in the, um, the super special edition slipcase that uses the artwork from the Persian uh, artist. And the narrator is uh, a lady who was born in uh, Iran as like me, but she came to England when she was a baby too. And her name is uh, Mitra Jalili, 
and she's an actress and she's been in things like Ted Lasso and lots of TV and stuff as well. And her cousin in the UK is uh, Omid Jajili, who's a um, stand-up comedian of Persian descent too. So he's been here, you know, his entire life too. And if you see him, you'll probably recognize him. Um, but um, yeah, so <laughs> remember I said there's like a Persian whisper network everywhere. Yeah, there is. I was talking to my dad and I'd mentioned who the narrator was. And he goes, oh yeah, that's uh, that's Omid's cousin. I'm like, no, it's not. I said, it's just the same name. He's like, no, it is. Check it out. I'm like, what? So I went and Googled it. And I'm like, yeah, it is. It is. It is. And he yeah. just had that information ready to drop on you? Yeah. He just knew. They're, like Persian actresses and actors are everywhere. Like, um, have you seen The Expanse? Any yeah. of, the, of the show? Uh, so Ava Sarala, Shuri Agdashlu, she's Iranian. Uh, Rings of Power, the, one of the, the actresses in that. She's Iranian. I didn't watch Rings of Power. I nope, didn't really subject it, myself to it. It wasn't great. You <laughs> saved yourself. Uh, so the, 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 this, like, all these actors keep popping up, and you're like, oh, God, that's so-and-so. Um, yes, Omid is in Casanova, someone said. Omid's been in everything. Omid was in Gladiator. Um, he was in... Um, what else has he been? He's been like The Mummy and The Mummy Returns with Brendan Fraser back in the day. He's done films all the way back to that kind of thing. So he's been in like 20, 30 films. Um, who, who did Omid play in the Mummy? Yeah, he's the guy. He's the guide with the fez, the the fat bloke who says, "No, I can take you there, and I know where I'm going." And he's the one who gets eaten by the 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 scarabs that go under him when he's he's trying to steal the treasure. Oh, he, I love he, that he dude! Right out, and he, and he gets under. He's like, ah! and he runs I full love tempest. that guy. That's the prison guard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in, yeah, and in Gladiator, he's the um, the guy who's the the slaver because he sell. He says. Um, Oliver Reed's character says, you sold me queer giraffes. I want my money back. And he's like, no, no, I won't. And it's the same guy. <laughs> so, so, yeah, he's been in film and TV for like 30 years at this point. Okay. But, uh, mm -hmm. So I, t like I told you, the Persian Whisper Network is everywhere. <laughs> That's very cool. The Mummy I, is honestly one of my favorite movies growing up. Mm -hmm. It's like a, in, in the top 10. I love that movie. It's so good. It's so uh, the, cool. the comedic timing on that movie is next level. Like everybody just has amazing chemistry on screen. Even if, even if they don't off screen, I don't know, mm -hmm. but I mean, everybody was hitting their lines on point. It was funny. Um, I, I, I love <laughs> it's that so movie. good. I love that film. It's so good. It is a, it, it, that's why I was so mad when they rebooted it. Mm -hmm. I was just like, no, no, like he's back. Bring, just, just Bring fix Brennan, it. That Brennan never Brennan happened. Brennan. Mm -hmm. Let's bring Brendan Fraser back for one yeah. last raw. It'll probably be awful. I don't care. Like <laughs> we want to see it happen anyway, you know. Yeah. I, I'd be more than happy to go to the movie theater, which I never go to the theater anymore. Mm. Um to, to watch a, a movie with mm. Brendan Fraser. But you know, I, I thought it'd be good. I thought it'd be nice to have a Persian narrator. She knows the names, she knows the places, she can pronounce them all absolutely perfect. We talked beforehand. Um, and yeah, so Mitra has done the audiobook and it's it's out already, and um, she'll be you know working on two and three as well in due course. Very cool, very cool. How, have you listened to the audiobook? I've listened to some of it, yes. I, I was sent samples of a bunch and I picked, you know, and, and she and she was one of the ones I picked. Um, but yes, I've listened to bits of it, not the whole thing, because I'm like, I'm not sure I'll listen to all of my book again. Uh, Why not? Yeah. Well, maybe. Maybe one day. I've never done that. I don't. I, I struggle with audiobooks actually. Um, so, what what when writing like your sequels and stuff like that? How do you remind yourself of specific plot points that you need to continue through? A lot of charts, a lot of notes. Um, <laughs> I go back and reference the book sometimes, and be like, "Ooh," uh, and I have to go back and check things as well. So, okay, yeah, it's not. It's not always easy. With, with trilogies, yes, it takes work sometimes, constantly. And there's a lot of names in this book. So in the back of the paperback, there's a list of names of characters as well that tells you a little bit about who some of them are. Um, that gives you a bit more info. Oh, there is. <laughs> hey, look. Hey, look, it's right look. there. <laughs> Your proof is in the pudding. Yeah, so it'll tell you like who some of the characters are. I'll give you a reminder. Um, and uh, I think for book two, I'm going to do a previously on the Judas Blossom. So that if someone has been a year since they read book one, 
there'll be honestly i love when i'm out there that it, it's so helpful because I, I remember, I would say I remember 90% of the broad strokes in this book. Um, some of the finer details are lost to me. Mm -hmm. um, so in a year's I, time, you'll be like, uh, so. Honestly, I'll probably read book. Re There's a lot it. of things. Okay, that's fine too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> control F in the preview. Oh, control find. Yes. <laughs> True. If I'm looking for something, I'm like, I'm not quite sure. I can, yeah, you can do that. You can find it. It's the best way to do it. Yeah, yes, yeah. Books yeah. and Chocoholic is absolutely correct. Previously, it's just it's 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 necessary for this series because it's so complicated. I think I think it will. Um, yes, character lists and a map. So there is a map as well, which is in is in um, both it's in the paperback too and the hardback, which we both got. Uh, where where is it? Oh, we got it. There you go. Yes, there you go. So that's the map of the world and the four carnates. You can see the Il Carnate, the Chagatai, the Golden Horde, and the Empire of the Great Khan, which is where Kublai ruled at the same period. So you get a bit of idea. When they're moving around and they mention certain cities and certain places, um, you'll be able to look at the map and go, oh, that's where it is. From I wonder there. if you can get a boat from there to there. From the historical note. <laughs> Are you, that's a good callback. Uh, <laughs> um, are you going to uh, explore the kind of tension and the open warfare between Kublai and his brother? Yes. So uh, it's part of history in the Mongol Empire during this period. There are a lot of civil wars. There was one between Kublai and his brother. There's another one later on in history that's between Kublai and Kaidu. Who was someone else who challenged his authority? There was civil wars in other the other carnates as well. So all of this will feed into the story. The story still remains focused on the Il Carnate, and we'll hear what happens in the other places and the repercussions it'll have on, on the story that I'm telling. So it's not that we will go over there and see the wars, but the, the empire is still connected in some ways. Like if he suddenly wants troops and Kublai is having another war, he's not going to be sending you know, 100,000 soldiers to help fight because they can't. So, yeah, it's going to be complicated. Hey, hello. Hey, Palmer. <laughs> um, so, uh, we're, we're kind of getting closer to the end. I kind of want to talk about, like, big, uh, not big, I almost said big finish, which is wrong. <laughs> it's UK pace, but wrong oh, company. The, the audio, um, uh, Doctor, Doctor Who. Who's, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah uh, <laughs> Great, yeah, uh, my brain went somewhere it wasn't supposed to. Mm. Um, let me wrestle that back in. Okay, broken finding. <laughs> yes. So how how did that relationship develop, and how <clears throat> you know you've got these special editions, and you're signed and lettered and numbered? I know mm. you, David Rag, and a bunch of like local authors are really kind of close knit with the broken binding. How has that relationship been for you? It's been really, really good. Yeah, I've known I've known the people who who run it for the last almost since the beginning. Really, um, I I sort of I'm fairly local to them in terms of where they are in the UK. And initially, when they started out, they were doing signed book plates. They said, you know, can we send you some book plates and you sign them, and then we'll sell the books. And we did that with uh, some of my mage books. Um, and then it went on to the Coward and the Warrior. And then we started talking about doing a special with them and Angry Robot. Um, and now you know there's the subscription, of course, which I think I think you're on. Uh, um, I, I cancelled mine a while ago, but right, okay, but yeah, they have you know some fantastic, fantastic specials, and um... I wish I hadn't, but uh, I did. <laughs> I, well, I tried always... going, I tried going Goldsboro because like I was like, oh, Goldsboro's got a couple cool things, and then like there was just five months of just disappointment for mm. me. There were just yeah. books that I wasn't vibing with, so I canceled that. And then when I emailed Broken Binding, they're like, yeah, buddy. Like, there's a wait list. That's there's a wait long. list of about two to three years. And I'm just like, madness. <clears throat> but I, I, it's been great. I think some of the books they've done, special editions, have been fantastic. Well, so they've all been fantastic, but some of them you won't see somewhere else. So seeing some of mine done as a special edition, I think, was just was absolutely brilliant. Because they, they're the only books that I've had in hardback. Everything's been paperback up to now um so seeing it in hardback is fantastic and the artwork that they do and you know it's just even the end papers and everything it's brilliant and sprayed edges look at the sprayed edges on those suckers uh, i, I want to know how they do that 
it's digitally sprayed. It's amazing. It's so but, good. So, like, it, they stick it in a machine and it like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. does I it mean, like print? Yeah. Yeah. Because you've got the car and the warrior. They've, they've taken a slice of the map mm -hmm. and then put it on the sprayed edges on there. I mean, it's just, I mean, look at the end. Well, he's doing that. I'll show the end papers, everybody. Look, look at that. Oh, come so here. Good. Here so, go. so good. So in the oh. in the there's the coward. That's that's a portion of the map that's in the book as well with the figure and and stuff from the front. See, and they're blowing it up. It just looks so. They're amazing. They're so so good. Um, and they've got some the great edition. ones coming up. Yeah, look at that. And you you've got them wrapped in plastic as well, haven't you, to protect them? Yeah. <laughs> I should start doing that with them as well. <laughs> They're so shiny now. You, you think I'm going to spend that much money and not do that? You've got to protect them. Yeah. They're so good. They're they so, just so good. Pulling this out damaged it. Oh, my mm -hmm. dust jacket's ruined. What? The plastic or the actual dust jacket? No, it, it tore. Wow. Something on my shelf tore it. Uh-oh. What have you got on your shelf? It's sharp. I'm going to be investigating that. <laughs> Oh, that's so upsetting. Okay. Well, I don't know. nuts. That sucks. Just have to get another one. Oh, well. Oh, yeah. I'll have to scout them. <laughs> Maybe they've got some leftover dust jackets they'll be willing to send me. Uh, you never know. You never know. You never know. That makes me sad. Mm. But, <clears throat> yeah. that That's a, a sad note to end the interview on. But, you know. <laughs> I'm going to go cry now. Oh. <laughs> Maybe we can get you a dust jacket. <laughs> Maybe. If I can get a dust jacket, that would be amazing. We'll see. But, mm. Stephen, that's, that's really all I've got today now that I've destroyed a book uh, that can't be replaced. Um, <laughs> thank you for joining me. People, please check out the Judas Blossom. It's amazing. And again... You can check the description box down below for links to his landing, his author's landing page on Amazon. And uh, yeah, that's that's all I really got. Is there anything else you want to say? No, 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 I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I appreciate yeah. all the enthusiasm for the books. You know, yeah. it's really, really great. Sadness. Sadness. <laughs> all right. Well, we're going to do the long goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.